Thank you, folks. Good to be back in the pulpit. Three weeks ago on Sunday morning, I started to read this scripture, and you know what happened. So we're going to read it again and try it again. The devil's not going to keep me from preaching that, Amen. that truth. So we're reading from the book of Colossians. You have your Bibles, open them to Colossians chapter 1, and if you're able, stand with me as we read from God's Word. Colossians chapter 1, we'll begin reading at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which under, was under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made. A minister. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this evening. Bow your head for a moment, please. We're grateful for all the word says that you did for us, Lord. We ask your blessing upon these words, and may they sink into our hearts and minds this evening. For that we will thank you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah for the cross. Where would we be without it? And what kind of disaster might our life have been given over to if not for the cross? We all should be forever grateful Amen. for the cross. Amen. Amen. Paul tells us in verse 20 that God has reconciled all things unto himself. That includes us. Through the self-sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Peace is somehow achieved for us. Through the blood of the cross. God saves us from sin and disaster. Do what Christ did on that cross. Why was that so? Verse 19 says it was because it pleased the Father to do it that way. I've heard people say, why did God do it that way? I don't know, but it pleased the Father, it said, to do it that way. And verse 22 says that the purpose of reconciling us to God through the cross, is so that he might present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight someday. Mm -hmm. We needed reconciled to God because our sins had indeed alienated us from God. Verse 21 says we had actually become God's enemies because and by our wicked works. Now think about that. If it says we were God's enemies, what in the world would that have made that joker that Waylon was talking about this morning, that uh, psychology professor that actually is accusing God of raping the Virgin Mary against her consent. He needs somebody to say it is a fearful thing to stand in the presence of the living God. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Amen. Yeah. And in this area of promoting self-esteem and not wanting to offend anyone and of stressing only the God loves you part of the gospel, it may seem strange for even you to hear yourself referred to as God's enemy. But that's what it says here. So thank God He has made it possible for us to be reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus' cross and to no longer be considered God's enemy. I once was an enemy, but I'm not an enemy anymore. Amen. And I know most of you are in those same shoes. You realized you were an enemy, but you're not an enemy anymore. You were smart enough to call upon God and to go through what Jesus did on the cross for you. And now God is your heavenly Father, your friend, your Savior, a whole bunch of other stuff. But the enemy part has disappeared. Now, we best not forget that our presentation to God in an unblameable manner is conditioned on this important thing called continuance. Verse 23 says, If we continue, if we continue to walk in the faith and become grounded and settled in the cross, then everything will be well for the present and for the future. But we dare not allow ourselves to be moved away from the hope that the cross gives us. And think about this. You know there are some Christians that think it's impossible for you to get moved away. If there could be no such thing as being moved away or falling away, well then what in the world would be the purpose of this warning? Amen. I mean, there would be no purpose. So what starts at the foot of the cross? We must continue to walk in every day of our lives. Yep, amen. Otherwise, our life could return to the disastrous path we were headed down when Christ found us and reconciled us to God through the cross. And if we go back, I think we all realize that our lives will even be worse than if we had never heard of the cross in the beginning. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. He says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have even known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment that was delivered unto them. So, Thank God for the cross. Amen. But don't ever turn your back on it. Nope. Don't ever walk away from it. Nope. Don't ever think you got it made and you don't have to think about the cross or, or what it means to you anymore. As the words of that great old hymn says, keep on cherishing and clinging to that old rugged cross. Till the day comes when your trophies you will at last lay down so that someday you can exchange them for a crown. Can't wait for that day. And as Galatians 6.14 says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. 
In other words, there's nothing for me to ever brag about other than the cross. And God forbid that I should ever think that I am anything beyond it. <clears throat> I want to share a story with you this evening to which the author's name has somehow been lost. But it is a powerful story worthy of sharing. It's a little lengthy, but it is good. In 1967, while taking a class in photography at the University of Cincinnati, I became acquainted with a young man named Charles Murray, who also was a student at the school, and who was training for the Summer Olympics of 1968 as a high diver. Charles was very patient with me as I would speak to him for hours about Jesus Christ and how he had saved me. Charles was not raised in a home that attended any kind of church, so all that I had to tell him was a fascination to him. He even began to ask questions about forgiveness of sin. Finally, the day came when I put the question to him. I asked if he realized his own need of a Redeemer and if he was now ready to trust Christ as his Savior himself. I saw his countenance fall and I saw the guilt in his face. But his reply was a strong no. In the days that followed, he was quiet, and often I felt he was avoiding me. Until I got a phone call, and it was Charles. He wanted to know where to look in the New Testament for some verses that I had given him about finding salvation. I gave him the references to several passages and asked if I could meet with him. He declined the offer and thanked me for the scripture I'd given him. I could tell that he was greatly troubled, but I did not know where he was or how to help him. Because he was training for the Olympic Games, Charles had special privileges at the university pool facilities. Sometime between 10.30 and 11 o'clock that evening, he decided to go for a swim and to practice a few of his dives. It was a clear night in October. The moon was bright and big and it shone across the top of the wall in the pool area. Charles climbed to the highest platform on the highest board to take his first dive. At that moment, there alone on that diving board, the Holy Spirit began to convict him of his sins. All the scripture he had read all the occasions of witnessing to him about Christ suddenly flooded his mind. He stood on the platform backwards to make his first dive. He spread his arms to gather his balance, looked up at the wall, and saw his own shadow caused by the light of the moon. You know what the shadow was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the shape of the cross. Amen. And once he saw that, he could bear the burden of his sin no longer. His heart broke. And he knelt down there on that diving platform and asked God to forgive him 
and save him as the tears flooded his face and he cried out to God. He trusted Christ 20 some feet up in the air above that swimming pool. All of a sudden the lights in the pool area came on. He was in there in the dark. The attendant had come to check the pool. And as Charles looked down from his platform, no water. he saw an empty pool, uh -huh. yep. which had been drained for repairs that day. He had almost plummeted to his death. But the cross had stopped him. Yep, amen. From disaster. Amen. amen. Yep. What a powerful story that is. <clears throat> Again, the guy's name was lost that wrote it, but I'm glad the story somehow survived. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe your story was not that dramatic. But I hope you have some kind of a story about how the cross saved your life from disaster. If you don't have one, you need to get one. Amen. By trusting Christ. Because without Christ, the road you're on, no matter what road it is, is leading to some kind of a disastrous ending. Mm -hmm. No matter what kind of a road you're on. It might even seem like a good road. If you're on it without Christ, the road you're following is leading to some kind of a disastrous end. Now Jesus came to earth to save you and me from our sins. That's what the angel said to Joseph, calling him <coughs> Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. And to save us from the disastrous ending to our life that sin always brings. What kind of disastrous ending might your life come to someday? without the cross. If you had chosen to walk down the wrong road, there's no guarantee you would even be sitting here this evening. If back yonder somewhere, when God spoke to your heart and dealt with your soul, and the Holy Spirit convicted of your sin, if you had chosen to reject what was offered to you, uh, who knows? There's no guarantee that any of us would be sitting here this evening. How would you like to die in prison? Or die sleeping under a bridge? Because booze, or drugs, or gambling addiction has robbed you of your money, your job, and your self-respect. <coughs> you could die alone because your obsession with pornography and the infidelity that followed it brought about a divorce and your kids won't speak to you anymore. Not a nice place to be. You might have taken your own life because you had none of the hope that the cross gives us. <coughs> Literally, the bad scenarios are endless. There's a million and one of them. You say, I hope you don't say, oh, I would never have let it come to that. I hear, I've heard people many times over the years tell me that. Oh, I would never let my life come to something like that. Do you suppose that even a single one of the people whose lives ended that way 
or any of those disastrous ways ever dreamed that their life would come to that kind of a disastrous ending? Who would plan for their life to turn out that way? Or to end that way? But sin always takes you farther than you want to go. And it always causes you to sink lower than you ever would have dreamed you would sink. But even people who go to church and try to live their life half decent, they too end up with a disastrous end to their life if they reject Christ. You can go to church and reject Christ. Going to church doesn't mean anything about knowing Christ or accepting Christ. You can sit in the pew every Sunday and be rejecting Christ. I ask you to praise God this evening for whatever kind of disastrous ending that the cross has kept your life from heading for. I can only imagine this time if I continue to walk down the road I was on when the cross made the difference in my life, I would be dead, in jail, <coughs> one of those things, addicted to something or other. And remember, were it not for the grace of God extended to you from the cross, whenever you look at that poor soul sleeping under the bridge, whenever you see a picture of that poor soul staring out at a hallway from behind prison bars, that could just as easily have been you, if not for the cross. Mm -hmm. Along with all the things that I hope you were thankful for back on Thanksgiving Day, and the things that I hope you still are thankful for, Amen. hope you didn't just make that a one-day thing, mm -hmm. I hope that a changed life was one of them. Mm -hmm. Your own Amen. changed life. And as you counted your blessings, which I hope you did, I hope one of those blessings was remembering where Christ brought you from. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to dwell very long on that this evening, and I don't want to bring back bad memories, but you remember where you used to be before Jesus. You remember what life was like before you met Jesus. And I hope that forever you will be thanking God that it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Amen. But unless God has changed your life through the cross, who do you even have to be thankful to? For all the blessings back there on Thanksgiving that you counted and remembered. There has to be somebody to be thankful to. And what do you have to look forward to this Christmas if the hope of salvation is not yours? I don't care how big the present, that isn't going to do it. I don't care how much money somebody gives you this year, that isn't going to do it. Santa Claus isn't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. That's not going to get it done. The cross is the center of it all. Now, the center of the Christmas message might seem like it's this manger here in front of me, this beautiful scene, the beautiful scene we have out on the, the lawn. The message of Christmas, this, the center of it, might seem like that's what it is. But always remember that the manger 
leads to the cross. Amen. Amen. You know, that star that the wise men were following, it, it's assumed that somewhere around two years after Jesus was born, the star was still there and it led the wise men to, to where Jesus was, probably in a house. How that star they were following kept shining, which is just as easily could have done so, it would have eventually led those three guys to a Roman cross mm -hmm. outside the city gates of Jerusalem. When Herod all had all those little babies, two years old or younger, killed, it was because the devil was trying to keep that little baby that had been born, that little baby who was a toddler by then, growing up and going to the cross. If all that had happened was he'd been born in a manger, that wouldn't have did much. Unless it had kept going and went to the cross. Now I'm not telling you not to put up a Christmas tree. We got, it. We got ours up. We actually, I said it, I'd never do this. But Paul and Walker didn't have any Fraser furs this year. You know what's going on with Paul. We finally broke down and bought a fake one. And uh, we have it up. And it's beautiful. But I hope your mind will not be on that Christmas tree, whether it's a real one or a fake one. I hope your mind will be on the cross in the days ahead instead of that brightly lit thing in the corner. The gals decorated the church so beautifully and they almost weren't going to put up a Christmas tree. And I think they're going to put it up over there in the, in the hall. And Waylon finally uh, insisted they about do it. And I'm, I'm glad they did. But as they did, I didn't want the Christmas tree to replace the cross. Amen. So we got it up here, even though Bernie has to watch hitting her head when she comes up on the platform. We don't want the Christmas tree to replace the cross. Don't let anything ever replace the cross. In a few weeks, that tree will go back in the box. That's going to be a new experience. It wasn't hard getting it out, but I don't know how it'll be putting it back in. Oh, yeah. In a few weeks, the tree will go back in the box, or if you've got a live one, it'll go out the door into the garbage or wherever it is that you take it. But the cross had better remain. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because the cross still remains. Thank God for the cross. Only it and what Jesus did on it can rescue our lives from whatever disaster sin might try to take us to. And I want to somehow instill in all our minds that no matter what path we're following, we don't have to be a Satan worshiper. We don't have to be a child molester or a wife beater. We know those paths lead to destruction. But any path other than the path of the cross leads to some kind of disaster. It leads to you leaving this place, leaving this earth, taking your last breath with no hope. No peace, no joy, and worst of all, no salvation or opportunity to find it out there after you leave. So, continue in the faith. All this is wonderful and all this is precious to us. We can rejoice in it. 
if we continue in the faith and become grounded constantly more and more each day in what the cross means, in what the cross represents, in what the cross gives us and brings to us, and to what it says to the world. Oh yeah, go ahead. I'm not one of those guys that says Christmas trees are evil, but don't let them replace the cross. Amen. They can both stand there, but once that one is taken down, this one will still be standing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand together. Let's bow our heads together. I would just ask you as we are ready to dismiss, wherever you were coming from when you bowed at the foot of the cross, even if it's been 50 years ago or longer, or if it's just been recently, wherever it was, whatever kind of road you were traveling down, Pause just a moment before we leave here this evening to thank God that you're no longer on that disastrous road, but you're on the road that leads to life. Praise God. Alan, would you please dismiss us with prayer?